everyone. Happy Wellness Wednesday. This is also Men's Health Month, so we're going to be focusing on some new topics today. We're talking about culinary medicine and fitness for men's health, and I'm joined again by Dr. Sam Pappas, who many of you don't know this portion about his career. He's also an expert in men's health. It's one of his favorite topics, so he's going to have a lot of resources for us and he introduced me to Chris Matisse who's a master's health coach and also the co-founder and trainer of Cypress Hill um, fitness and physical therapy so it's really going to be a rich topic just write in your questions if you have them for any of us um, Dr. Pappas and I are streaming it live on our uh, Facebook live pages so you can just go ahead and put it there and also if you have anything for Chris um, please feel free to add this this in um, fortunately this topic has a lot of overlap so between talking talking about uh, specific recipes, the Mediterranean diet, culinary medicine, men's health. We've got Father's Day coming up if you want to do any kind of um, you know, really healthful ideas to get um, dad or your husband or the man in your life um, in shape. This is a great time to talk about it. We're also adding in a new feature this week. We're going to be uh, live tweeting. So join us on Twitter at Dr. Sam Pappas at Amy Riolo, and uh, also at Lobby4, four, number 4U. Four, um, so we're gonna be tweeting a lot of different things. Any questions there, please feel free to put them up as well. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Great, great, thanks Amy. I think it's such a, a, a wonderful idea. You know, we were thinking about men's health and saying how much it times into what we're doing. Um, and then we both thought, let's bring in one of our favorite experts uh, in this field and someone who I uh, work with regularly, you know, a, a patient of mine once said, Chris is a combination of a fitness expert, uh, someone knowledgeable in nutrition, supplementation, vitamins, uh, but also like a psychologist and uh, uh, a life coach as well. And I thought it was a really good description of Chris's background. Uh, so I thought we would spend some time talking about, you know, the state of the union of men's health ways to help improve that, some of the tools that we give patients, and also, you know, pick Amy's brain because Amy and I have, you know, people who we work with, uh, both men and women, uh, and I think her expertise can really help us. We talk about what kind of foods in particular men may benefit from, especially if they're training, uh, if they're trying to lose some weight, so we'll give you some tips as well. Uh, but whenever I think about men's health, I always think about how challenging men's health can be and I think men don't always realize that uh, they get more diseases than women. Uh, they don't live as long as women. Um, they have other problems more than women do, for example, substance abuse, things like alcohol. Uh, mental health and suicides are more commonly in men. Uh, and in modernity with technology, uh, with computers, with gaming with young men, uh, we work with a lot of young men as well, we just find that in many ways they're going in the wrong direction, not in the right direction. So I think it's a good opportunity uh, for young men and, and older men and fathers as well. Uh, so Chris, I just wanna kind of get your take on, you know, how you assess men and how you assess patients when you see them and clients and what kind of things you think about as you go forward with the, an initial evaluation. Uh, for example, you know, I'll often send you a guy who's uh, overweight, has some fatigue, and who wants to get started in with you know fitness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Well, thank. First of all, thanks for having me. Um, you know, there. Everyone's different, right? So you know, when when we when we look at an assessment or an evaluation of someone, uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to make them comfortable, right? So we really want to get to what they want, and I know inherently what they want is they want me to tell them what they want. All right, so I got to start somewhere, right? So I always start with this comment first for everyone. I said. You never put something in your mouth by accident. All right, so as long as we can establish the ground rules, we can move forward with honesty, right? right. All right, so, so um, but when we look at people when they come in, there, there are many different factors that we look at, all right? But what I like to tell people um, when we get them on the floor and, and we just start chatting, is I say, you, you've ridden a bicycle, correct? All right, now if you went to that bicycle and the front wheel was crooked, you have two choices. You can get on the bike and ride it, and continue to break the wheel, or you can straighten the wheel and replace the wheel and make it straight and ride a straight bike, right? Well, your body is the same way to me, right? And it should be the same way to you. So if you come in here and you're crooked and I, we train you and you exercise on, on, a, on a crooked wheel, the wheel gets more crooked and you will break down. So the idea is 
we, we do a pseudo assessment and because of the advent of the internet, I mean, there's millions of assessments out there, but what we really want to look at is how you stand, okay? Because how you stand is how you sit, it's how you move, all right? So if the crooked wheel's crooked, you're gonna be crooked somewhere. So every little detail is a detail. How your head is, how your shoulders are, how your hip stands, how you, where your knee points, where your ankles fall. Uh, is one foot forward more than the other? Is your right foot turned out more than the other? Is your pelvis tucked under or is it forward? There are many different factors we can just look at just from when you walk in the door, That's right? Great. And that is actually just metrics in itself because we can measure that with pictures and lines of symmetry, right? Mm. Then what happens is we'll, we can put people through a myriad of testing, but what we really want to do for, especially for men, um, and for adults, because you're gonna lose primary things. You're gonna lose lateral flexibility because we sit all day. You're gonna lose rotator cuff strength in your shoulders, and we're gonna lose lower trap strength. So we test all those things. Well, what's the traps, Chris? I don't think about it. So the traps are what elevate your shoulders, right? So yeah. things that come up here. So what happens is, um, generally, and most of you online probably know this, you are gonna have knee pain, back pain, shoulder pain. Okay, that's generally happens. They're all generally taken care of by 20% of certain exercises, wow. all right? Generally speaking, you don't need surgery or those type of things. But when we look at metrics for men, because a lot of men are type A and they like metric and they like to gauge from point A to point B, sure. we can actually do that, all right? So I know exactly how much strength you're gonna need based on your body type when you come in based off some simple tests. And we have a, we have a point A and if it falls below a certain threshold, we know we have to get you to point B. So if a guy comes in here and we make jokes, it's bench press Mondays, biceps Tuesday, and then they don't work out the rest of the week, right? But if we have certain metrics, I can increase those type of exercises by doing ancillary exercises to make you healthy, make you stand up straighter and do those type of things. So we, we standardize that. Um, and then if you take that and then you give me uh, a male that comes in as a weekend warrior, we can assess knee health and ACL prevention, all that type of stuff with analytics over years and we can put you in a database and we can find where you fall and where you should be. And then if need be, we'll refer you out to the physical therapy or to Dr. Pappas or what needs to be. Oh, that's right? great. I that's use the good. term weekend warrior for the kitchen too. Yeah, People absolutely, right? On the weekend. Yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah, right? So does that, does that? Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. I think that's great. So you, you do a, a visual hands-on assessment. It sounds like focusing on the musculoskeletal system, core stuff. Um, and then what's the, kind of the next step? So you get a sense, and a lot of our guys, like you said, they're weekend warriors. Uh, I tell them, it's time to see Chris. They start working out even before seeing you. Uh -huh. They often have some injuries. Um, and they don't know what to do as far as next steps, like what to eat, what workouts to do. So what happens on the next phase for you? So you get this assessment, so you know they need flexibility work. Sure, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, as you said, you know, they're type A, a lot of guys want the, uh, the before versus the after picture. And summertime is coming, and of course they want the beach body. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna tell you now, I wanna lose weight and make muscles. So what do you do next? So the first thing I ask them is, is, how much have you been on the internet researching what you should be doing? Because it's true, right? Then the second question I ask them is, how old are you? Mm. And they'll say, I'm 50. And I say, okay, well, you're not 40 anymore. So the general rule of thumb is, everyone who comes into the gym trains like they're 10 years younger than they are. Because oh, wow. that's what they remember the most, 10 years previous. Mm. So they go from A, and then they go to Z immediately. Okay, so everyone who comes in, especially at the beginning of the year, okay, it's 14 days from January 1st to January 14th, day 15, 94% of everyone's quit. Really? We can get into that whole reason why. Wow. Okay, I can go That's for hours on that. That's but amazing. you come into exercise, the first thing they do is, okay, I'm exercising, I'm doing low carb diet. They're doing that at the same time. All right, then they do that, then they're changing other healthy things. Someone may quit smoking at the same time. Someone may be drinking more water as opposed to, taking a habit and making it a habit, sure. all right? You do one habit, you're 80% more successful. You add two habits, it drops down to like 30. Because wow. remember, one habit takes like 30 habits before it to make the one habit happen. So we have to really dive into the psychology of what they're looking at and what they want to do. And what I do is, this is going to be very different for a lot of you there. We don't look at their goals. I talk about the reasons why they failed their goals in the past. Mm -hmm. because we have to eliminate the limits of why you failed so you don't fail again because you're coming into me already knowing you failed before 
So I have to teach you how to get rid of that limit so you can reach your goal at the end. So I don't, you, we don't use goals. We use inspiration statements because you're human. You are going to have dips, right? You're gonna have valleys and highs and peaks. You're always gonna have a valley. You are human. We work, we live, we have kids, we don't eat enough, we don't sleep enough, we go too hard. You're gonna have a valley. I have to teach you how to manage the valley so you can see the end. And we do that through inspiration statements. And we teach people to build an inspiration statement. So when they're in the valley, they can go to that inspiration statement and what we call owning the space. So they get to the next day and they don't quit. So instead of day 14, they're at, they get to day 15, 16 and 17 and so on. So that's how we start building their habit. Wow. I just want to remind anyone if you have any questions for Chris or for Dr. Pappas or me, just let us know. Go ahead and type them in. But uh, I think that this concept of the inspiration statement is great. You know, it's um, it's a wonderful motivator. I love the psychology behind it. I think what you just gave us in, in you know, 120 seconds, probably we can spend 120 days, days on it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I love it. But I just, I would love, you know, for people at home, like an example of it. Great. Okay. So I'll... let's say their goal is. I want to lose 20 pounds and get my numbers down so when I come to Dr. Pop, okay. everyone's happy. Right. Where would you All go right. from So it? first thing I would tell them, is because this is important, in the industry, in marketing, in the world, they say you're going to lose 20 pounds in 12 weeks or 6 weeks or whatever. It's, it's, it's built-in failure. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because if you do the math backwards and you're not at the math, you've already, you're into that negative valley and you're failing. So now yeah. your, your self non-self-serving language is horrid, right? So what we say is, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to be? So I'm gonna, let's take client, let's take Alice, okay? Alice wants to, we'll say lose 20 pounds, we'll use your example. Sure. I'll say, Alice, that's fantastic, okay? Let's not put an end on it, okay? Let's just work on it, okay? But let's build an inspiration statement around it. And I'm using this example, if there's anyone on here that's worked with me, um, one of my mentors, Carrie Campbell, used this same example with me. And um, so what we do is we build an inspiration statement of it's one of four pillars that we build into their life. OK, wow. OK, it's one of four. It's not just one. Mm -hmm. So we have learn your language. We have review your direction. Um, we have count your wins and we have your inspiration statement, basically. OK, wow. an inspiration statement basically is uh, what we call imagination theater. It's one of the many tools we have. And um, I said, so what, what is, what do you look, what do you feel like when you lose 20 pounds? What are you going to feel? And she'll say, play the game with me. Come on, okay. play the game. What are I'm going to feel, feel like? vibrant. Vibrant. Healthy, okay, great. All right. Who does that remind you of? <laughs> this is okay. Pink. Pink. Say pink. Pink. Okay. pink. All right. That's a great example. Okay. Like vibrant, right? Really fit. Um, uh, so uh, when you think of pink, what do you, what is that? What does she embody to you? Energetic. Energetic. So you're going to be fit, energetic, like pink. Boom. Oh, inspiration statement. That's a short, short version. But we build it because it has to mean something to you. It has to have a visceral pull. So a person and then a feeling. It, it could be anything. Okay, I'm going to give you. I'll give you mine. So everyone, I'll share it with you. I don't mind being vulnerable. Do like it with Sam so we can have a okay. guys, guys. But, but guys. so <laughs> just so you know, I'm I am highly dyslexic. Okay, and one of the things with dyslexia is you rush constantly, all right? Your brain is fast. So I have a lot of things in the fire, right? So I go too fast. I rush all the time. So my inspiration statement currently is unstoppable 66. Here's why. I want to be unstoppable in my business acumen and how I help people, right? But my dad took me on this journey on Route 66 a long time ago in a car and I was bored. And he said, son, just stop and enjoy the scenery. Mm. We'll get there when we get there. So 66 has a visceral response in me to my father to a moment, but it was about being slow and um, it's about progress and not perfection as we do that. So it's unstoppable 66 for me. So, and if I related to weight loss, if I wanted 20 pounds, like everyone else, I want 20 pounds tomorrow. Well, if I'm unstoppable 66 and I, at a week I'm not, and I don't have one pound, I could be okay. <sighs> not negative. I'm owning the space. Unstoppable 66. Where am I going to be at the end? How am I going to feel? What am I, what am I wearing? What's the weather outside? Where am I at? How am I feeling? What are the clothes I'm going to be wearing when I reach that goal? visualization. Oh, yeah. That's it's imagination awesome. theater. Awesome. Pillar number four. That's great. All right. So that's one. Of, that's just one way we'll start building that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing of how we would build the psychological foundation 
in a, in a, an assessment to start. And we do that because people overload themselves, especially in this area, because we're so fast paced and we have so much going on and we want it now that I have to, I have to step them back and I have to have them imagine their life, not two weeks from now, but we have to, I have to get them the tools to get them through life. And that's where people miss the mark. That's amazing. Okay. That's great. So then Chris, the question that, you know, we guys have, is okay i want to get stronger and get buff for the summer but then i tell them you know metabolism and weight is more diet than exercise you know how do you Correct. start that engagement with them because they want to get into the gym and lift you know like you said 10 years younger. 10 years younger right. that weight mm -hmm. uh so they're always shocked when you know the the, fit, the nutrition part is very important mm -hmm. and that they should be discussing that with you mm -hmm. and they often don't i know you bring it up of course right. so how do you engage uh, the stubborn men when they go down that path so we have to be honest right and we have to talk about their day and, and realist realism for them um do they have a chef do they have an assistant that can get them food every day five times a day six times a day okay then then they'll say well i'm intermittent fasting now okay that's great intermittent fasting works great but if your goal is x putting on muscle okay intermittent fasting won't work in that vein to put on muscle because I have to have a calorie surplus, all right? A healthy one. But if your goal to me to come in is to lose 20 pounds, you're going to put on muscle, but I can't do both at the same time, all hmm. right? So we have to have an understanding. So what would you do first? We, we discussed uh, recently about different fastings uh -huh. and a lot of patients, as you know, are interested in fasting, whether it's an intermittent fast mm -hmm. or eating less calories. Uh, but I know when I did a uh, one of those fasts, the fasting mimicking diet, I measured my body composition before uh -huh. and after, yep. and I lost weight, but I also lost some muscle. Correct. Uh -huh. And I had not thought about it until I did that. Mm -hmm. It's just like a stubborn guys wanting a metric. So I know in the fitness world, it kind of changes. Should we get guys to be lean first or build muscle first? Fantastic question. So how do you how do you think of that concept? It's a fantastic question, and you have to get someone lean first. Really? Okay. But it's new, isn't it? I mean, kind of no, newer. No, no, a little bit. That always a little, been, uh... No, no, it's, it's not new. Um, but if if someone came in here 100 pounds overweight, Sam, and you came in here, two clients, two different scenarios. I wouldn't want to get you. I would get. I wouldn't want to get you leaner. I would want to maintain your weight and get you stronger. The client who came in 100 pounds overweight, I wanna, I wanna get them leaner. But I know if I get him leaner, I'm gonna get him stronger because he's working out correctly with strength training. So if I get them leaner, then I can get them stronger after. For some people who come in and under, this is, this is new, and this is what, this is the world that's coming out so people understand this. A lot of people are coming to see us that are carb intolerant because of the low carb fad. Okay? So what happens is they don't eat much many carbs at all. Like I'm talking zero, like zero fifty. And as soon as they eat carbs, they're putting on 10, 15 pounds in a couple weeks. Wow. Their metabolism is shot. Yeah. And then they come and say, I want a six pack ab, I want X, I want performance. We have to actually say to them, I gotta put like 10 pounds on you. Wow. I have to heal your metabolism to give you all the goals. So we have to do that first, then we can get you what you want, or I'm gonna do it unhealthy and that's not serving you. So we have to have honest conversations. We have to see what, what they really, if they're ready for that. So you're really taking a, uh, intake about the past experiences mm -hmm. with the carb diets yeah. and, and what, because a lot of dieters, even okay. men have gone through these diet right. phases, right? I mean, a lot of men tell me, oh, my wife diets, but I don't, but when you ask them, They've done the low carb Atkins yeah. South Beach numerous times. Mm -hmm. Will lose weight. Yep. And you said gain it again. Gain it again back because they haven't eliminated the limits. Why they have to keep doing it. Yeah. Okay. That's a great point. Then we have we have someone we have to heal the metabolism. And now let's take a female come in 115 pounds, 120, eating 900 calories a day. Wants to get smaller. Okay. She's going through menopause or you know so certain kinds of things. She doesn't eat much at all. Right. But for her to lose weight she's she dropped her calories even lower 
now she's exercising more. So I could tell it real simple. I said, there's three scenarios we live by. If you exercise more, you have to eat more, EM, EM. Mm -hmm. If you eat less, you have to exercise less, okay? The common scenario that magazines teach us is we exercise more EM with EL, eat less, right. which is the scenario to fail because you, it starts to work and then because people don't eat enough and their metabolisms are shot, your body's metabolism stops. And then now you're just spinning your wheels and then you get frustrated, all the psychology comes in and you just quit. So some people, they come in, they exercise a lot and then they tell me they wanna lose weight. I'm like, well, here's what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can eat as, just like you are, but you're only exercising twice a week, not six. Now that right there yeah. is like a train stop. It's right? a lot of high cortisol for them. Ooh. Wow. You tell someone who's exercising a lot not to, so then we go, okay. And it's, it's not six days, right? right. You're telling them. Yeah. Right. It's, you, okay, no, you're gonna like exercise five days next week. Okay, and we come in, I'm like, how you doing? I'm like, okay. This week, four days. Right? So we so we we do what's best for the person. Okay? And but that has a box in it and everyone's outside the box. Right. Wow. Right? So you have to really listen. And you really have to, for a lot of people, you tell them that, but you have to work on all the other things to get them to accept the realism of what's going on. So you're really personalizing it based on their goals and their needs. And many times, you know, your goals for them are in, in, in the statements you make are different than what they came in with initially. Yeah. Um, but you and I both will take our time to go through um, habits in a typical day. Mm -hmm. So how do you kind of go through that with, with let's, Let's keep going with the stubborn man that we sure. have who wants to lose the weight and, and get some muscle mass. And uh, I, I find that part of the health challenge in, in modernity is the uh -huh. cult and the culture. And Total culture, 100%. Is, mm -hmm. plays a big role. And, and Amy and I are big onto that. And, you know, even in the food, right? It's, it's, it's never just that nice Greek salad mm -hmm. or the wonderful mozzarella cheese. It's what the culture is and, and who you eat with. Mm -hmm. So how do you go through some of those habits for those guys? And, you know, he's somebody who works in an office. And you know, he doesn't understand that his daily habits really contributing to where he is. Mm -hmm. uh, Taking through some of those things that you do, right? With so um, let's you let's stick to uh, food as an example because we could have we could do relationship, we could do how they deal with money, fitness, all that. Let's just stick with food. And let's say we get an executive; he's working twelve hours a day, travels four days out of the week, and, and he and he wants to lose weight. And you just look at him, and you, the first thing he says, "Do you drink water?" huge right i mean right, if you right. just google water and think of all the great things it does for you they're like yeah i drink water i drink a lot of water i'm like how much do you drink they're like oh, i drink two of these a day i'm like oh, okay okay so uh so what if we had a goal for you you drank two liters a day to start and they're like okay i could do that and i'm like okay so can't i want you to answer me a question on a scale of one to ten ten being absolutely successful how successful would that goal be to drink two big of these a day and they'll go, mm, oh, depending on travel, five. All right, that's not a good habit. Mm -hmm. Okay, it has to be at least eight. It has to be eight. Okay, that's the only thing I give them. Mm. All right, if it's five, okay. Do you take any supplements? All right, they're like, nah, supplements are crap. I go, just one, just one. What about fish oil? All right, give you a little fat, healthy fat, help your brain a little bit, might make you work a little better. They're like, okay, I can do that. It's just a pill, right? I'm like, sure. Okay. It's one to ten. Can you do that? One to ten. Uh, that's an easy one. I can do ten, right? That's your habit right there. That's how we start habits. So we have we have a list, right? Yeah. So it's water, exercise, um, uh, leafy green vegetables because mm -hmm. no one eats them. Um, sleep would be a big one. Yeah. Okay. We could so we could do three years of sleep. By the way, talking about point. sleep. Um, but water is one I like to start with because. Yeah. As people become more hydrated, they actually wake up better. And their day is more productive because they're alert. Right. Now they'll, they'll say, well, I don't want to get up and pee all the day. I'm like, it's natural. Mm -hmm. all right? If you're urinating, it's a natural thing. And the first thing my daughter learned uh, health-wise was what color should her pee be? Mm -hmm. She's six mm -hmm. and she knows the answer. That's great. And she'll come home and say, daddy, my pee is dark yellow. I need water now. <laughs> Right? But yeah. as an adult, yeah. we don't yeah. we don't know the simple things. That's a great point. I, I even find that also in the kitchen is like 
nowadays a lot of people because there's because people are so used to experts telling them everything and doctors and kind of having to go that route that they don't trust their own bodies so they'll say because i'm a chef does this recipe have enough salt in it you know that's a highly personal uh, thing because mm -hmm. you're a doctor does this because you're a fitness expert but they, they've taken all the trust away from yourself mm -hmm. if, if you're thirsty a lot or you're having certain symptoms or you're lacking energy water is a great thing if you're drinking a lot of coffee or or uh, wine or beer or things that dehydrate you mm -hmm. water is a good thing summer you're working out Mm -hmm. Winter, it's dry. Water is a good thing. And there's like so many reasons, but we, they always need that confirmation. It seems like, mm -hmm. um, and and we don't trust, you know, what what we need ourselves. Some of the examples that we were giving earlier were very personal things that people could could just feel on their own and saying, oh, I need to make this adjustment. But I feel a lot of people lack the confidence to to trust their own instinct. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh huh. That's a great yeah. point. Chris, what about a question that I get a lot? Is um, you know, how do I change some of my activity and fitness stuff in a typical day uh, because I may have only access to Chris twice a week uh -huh. or as you said you know maybe less than initially thought uh -huh. I, I like to use the the terms uh, is sitting the new tobacco uh -huh. right we've talked about this uh, I'll joke with patients and say we've kind of become couch potatoes not only at home but also at work because we're on a desk uh -huh. and we've chosen the wrong Homer right Homer right. Simpson rather than uh -huh. ancient Homer <laughs> right. And Homer Simpson rather than Achilles, right? So I'm, gonna, I'm stealing that joke. Yeah, that was awesome. you, everyone, pay attention. Yeah. He's starting to, he's starting to I, share. I, I had a lot of things that I'd be happy to share, but so uh, you, I try to tell them movement is medicine, uh -huh. uh, but they don't always get that concept. So how do you kind of build that into them? Because you know you want them moving, and a lot of them now are into these Fitbits mm -hmm. and they're tracking stuff and the whole measurement and metrics. So what do you do when you tell them, listen, I want you drinking some water, taking some fish oil, I've got to get you a little bit more active uh -huh. until I see you at next next session to go on to the next phase. Great question. Uh, I'd make it really simple for them. What do you like to do? Because if they don't like it, they're not going to do it. Here's what I, <laughs> this is true. Mm -hmm. If you are paying for fitness advice and you're going to someone, the chance of you doing the exercise on your own now drops dramatically because you're paying to get your butt there, hmm. oh. okay? So what I find is, or I found, is that people are less likely to exercise on their own now that they're paying for it. Interesting. Even if you were exercising on your own before. Really? And you're coming. So um, what I ask them, I said, what do you like to do uh, on your own? Is it basketball? Is it going for a walk? Is it, it would it be more beneficial going to walk with your spouse? or your significant other, or go play out in the yard, go play dark guns with your kids. Something that gets them moving, that's fun, mm -hmm. right? In the facility we have, we purposely built in, um, into memberships and stuff, group classes that they can just come take at the appropriate times when adults are available, so they don't have to think and just do the exercise, mm -hmm. all right? So that, though, that's why the fitness industry has grown into group classes and those type of things. It's not because it's, uh, such a, it, it helps the finance of the gym. It really was built initially to give clients the answer because they weren't exercising on their own. If they get into the car and go to the gym, they're more likely to exercise oh. than, than at home. But if it's at home, it has to be something they enjoy. Uh, but then you have your super high type A people. Right. Okay. They're like, I get up at 5.30 every morning and run. And I'm like, okay, what's your travel schedule? I'm traveling five times. I get in at 11.30, 12 at night, every night. I'm like, well, you're not getting up anymore to do your exercise. Wow. Let's sleep first. Because if you are feeling more rejuvenated, when you come in, your exercise is gonna be better. You're gonna get more out of it. And actually your exercise that early in the morning may be a stressor leading you to some of these other reasons that you're having. So we have to play with that a little bit yeah. with some people. So we, we definitely have to back people off. I know there's the challenge about, we can discuss uh, overtraining. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a population. I think for our intents and purposes, most people are the opposite. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not there yet. Um, but a question that I grapple with in, re in reviewing a lot of this discussions, uh, is it better to exercise in the morning versus in the afternoon? And should I do more than one exercise? A lot of my patients, when they get motivated, are going to do cardio in the morning and then mm -hmm. weight work or resistance exercise, you know, mm -hmm. straining your muscles in the afternoon 
uh, how do you take guys through that schedule when you try to incorporate some fitness? Can we break it up into two questions? Absolutely. absolutely. So can we address the overtraining? Yeah. Because I thought you were going somewhere with this. Um, and this is what I truly believe. There are There is overtraining. So let's take the classic CrossFit athlete trains four to five times a day. They're going to overtrain fast. We don't have to worry about that with our population. But in populations like Northern Virginia and D.C., people who travel a ton, training too hard one time every day or four, four times a week will overtrain them because wow. their, their systems can't handle the, the intensity of the exercise because it becomes an overstressor of their systems and they can't work well. Yeah. So you actually, they come in and because they're coming in, they want it hard, you actually don't train them hard. You don't work out hard, you work out. Right. You leave feeling okay. You know, you can have a conversation in the gym, you're not laying on the ground at the end of it. You know, every rep doesn't have to be the, f the worst rep in the world. You should go in the gym, enjoy it, and leave, and you had a good time, and you worked, but you didn't overdo it. And by and that, you will be more fit and healthier because you did that. So that was how I address the overtraining issue. Yeah, yeah. I see that all the time. Yeah. All the time. It's underappreciated. Now, when to train. Yeah. Or what to train. Uh, depending on your goals, if you are a strength and you want to need to put on muscle, if you are going to train um, in the morning or at night, it becomes time availability. If time is not the right time, and I'm sorry, if time is no option, right? You're gonna, you would train three hours after you wake up and then six hours from that three hours. So if I got up at six, the best time to train is at nine. Mm. Then the next best time to train is at three because of the cortisol release in your, your circadian rhythm. So before those who try to get some exercise, you know, the crack of dawn, kind of like the military. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, challenges, because the cortisol is not high enough yet or is it too high? I would say it's not high enough yet. Okay. You're still in you know, your synovial fluid and all those things in your body aren't ready unless you've pr properly warmed up to train correctly. So more than a s systemic hormone, you're saying joint-wise, Yes. you're uh -huh. not ready, yeah. you're not flexible enough. Total. My training early in the morning is 30 minutes longer than if it is three hours later, because it takes me that much longer to warm up. So whether or not we do some cardio or some resistance muscle work, uh -huh. it's still the same kind of... Yeah, same, same same approach. Um, if you're going to do both in a, in a scenario, do your strength work first, cardio last. So why is that? Why is the strength always first? A lot of patients will do some running and then try to finish with some. Because they think the cardiovascular exercise can make the weight go away. It's a psychological. They that's what we've been taught for years and years and years. Hmm. More cardiovascular. But I ask you, if I can get your heart rate at 150 beats a minute doing this, or running on a treadmill, what would you choose? this mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it's just my heart rates up but if i'm strength training and i can get your heart rate up as opposed to just running what's more beneficial i'm getting more things going strength training so you can strength train and get your heart rate up and get more bang for your buck than doing cardiovascular work That's cardiovascular works mm -hmm. for a certain finite period of time then it stops okay if i have someone who hasn't exercised at all and they're overweight they need to walk that is work mm -hmm. Okay? If I have someone who's fit and wants to um, get fitter, I would strength train them and then do cardiovascular second. Okay? In the, so in the CrossFit world, it used to be they would train twice a day when they were athletes. They did their wad in the morning, then they did their heavy weight work at night, which was totally wrong. Mm. They should have done their, they've swapped it now, they do your heavy weight work in the morning, your, so your high CNS system work first. Then you do your... So what's CNS training. for people who may not know that? Term. So that would be um, maximal effort training. So your nervous system, how well it responds. It your nervous system takes, I think it's three times longer to recover than the actual muscle. All right? So that that is a big thing we have to deal with. Yeah. For certain people, not everyone. Right, right. So talking about cardio now, um, when I tell patients about intervals, about bursts, mm -hmm. about high-intensity interval training... There's still a lot of people who don't understand that uh -huh. and aren't practicing it. And I try to frame it as you can do more with less. Right. Imagine you can get a better result uh, with an interval or a burst. So, you know, what is HIT? How do you explain it? How do you approach, you know, the clients and having them do, you know, this targeted cardio? Right. So, when we work with 
clients and we're under a time constraint, right? So you want more bang for your buck, okay? The best things, right? So I wouldn't have a client do bicep curls, to have them do a lunge, do a curl, to an overhead press, something that's multi-joint. When you look at cardiovascular work, can I, how can I get my heart rate up to increase my, um, my standard heart rate, right? So if I just do steady state cardio, that's time, right? So I need an hour, 40 minutes, but now I want to strength train, I want to stretch, I do all those things. But if I do interval-based training, I can spike my heart rate and drop it, spike it and drop it. So you can ba basically average the two and that's your um, standard heart rate, okay? Your steady state heart rate. So, but you get so much more benefit hormonally and aerobically, anaerobically, anaerobically from the interval base. So to keep it simple for those of you watching, take whatever you work, your work phases, let's say it's a minute, your rest is always half and just repeat it. So the, if you do like 30 seconds of a, of like on a bike uh -huh. of a cardio burst, as fast as you can go, right? Right, as fast as you Which can. Which obviously in the beginning may not be that fast. Uh -huh. So you're saying 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off. Correct. So always half. Always half, know. right. And uh, so someone's doing that, and it doesn't matter what equipment they use, whether it's on elliptical, whether it's running on stairs, whether it's you know running in place. Whatever they like. Whatever they like, so it's whatever. all pretty similar. Right, so when we, when we work with people, I have a standard list, I'm like, what do you hate, what don't you like to do? Why, I'm not gonna give it to you. Why would I give it to you? you want, I need you to come in. Why would I give you something you hate? Right. Like that's a it's a pet peeve of mine when trainers you're it gonna do it because you're gonna do it because you because I told you to do it. I mean, come on, you're here. Let's have fun. Right. Just, if you don't like it, we'll find something else. For every exercise, there's thousands more you could do. So right. No. Now, it, for rehab purposes, maybe we have to do it. But sure. In general, whatever someone likes. Great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, if you like to run, run. Yeah. But you gotta if you're doing interval and you want to get the best out of it and you only have a short amount of time, you gotta. You put the work in to make it work. You know what I mean? Right. You know, but then, you know, we could debate what I debated against myself. Maybe you don't need to do that because yeah. you need to back off a little bit. So right. it's, it's how you feel. Yeah, the, the end of one, right? The right. citizen mm -hmm. scientist and personalizing it. So one, one thing is patients are always, I think, surprised that they can do more with less with intervals. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they tend to not understand the power of straining their muscles and I throw these terms around and we'll give them some resources, but I love your take on the resistance exercises, these compound exercises. Mm -hmm. I know myself as uh, I learned from Chris about the role of what your build is. And I have a thin build, like a basketball mm -hmm. player's build. And I remember you saying to me, you know, it's hard to go from scrawny to brawny. Uh, you can do that, but it's difficult. Uh, but you can still benefit from resistance work creating some more muscle, doing compound exercises. Mm -hmm. And then I remember learning back in the day that these exercises are also good for the nervous system, as you said. Mm -hmm. So uh, I tweeted out recently about compound exercising, treating and preventing depression and anxiety. Uh -huh. Right, because it's a serotonin release in the brain. Correct. Yeah. yeah, so I'd love your take on, because a lot of guys, you know, here I gotta get my muscles and then get dumbbells to work on their big guns, right. Right. you know. Right, because that's st standard magazine fodder, right? right? But the reality is we don't have the time that a professional bodybuilder has to spend in the gym, nor do we have the time to eat that amount of food to make that happen, or the genes that that bodybuilder has, or the extra stuff he's pumping in his body to make the muscles bigger, right? So what we like to do is the, um, the best bang for your buck. Yeah. So we do a lot of functional training. Okay, functional training can, is a multitude of things, but what we all wanna do is get more things involved to maximize our time, right? So you could do a lunge, to a curl, to an overhead press, uh, you know, a, a, a power lifting move and a bodybuilding move would be deadlifting, but there are many versions that a standard person could do who isn't looking to max out, you know, lift the heaviest weight they can. So there are ways that we can get you to grow muscle just by being compound movements, right? And, you know, there are so many exercises in the world yeah it has to be safe right all right so standing on a basu ball squatting is, is idiotic right it's moronic it's not going to get you really bigger it's really fodder for the people in the gym to make yourself look cool yeah it's not going to get what you need out of it so a lot of times the basics are the easiest things to do you know push-ups pull-ups lunging 
squatting in different variations, lunging in different planes, things that get your body out of its comfort zone. It doesn't have to be super technical and have five different toys involved with it. When, when, you, when trainers start doing that, they're doing it for themselves, they're not doing it for the client, as I like to tell the staff. Sure. It has to be about the client. And a lot of times simple and consistent things prove way bigger returns than trying to be all sexy with all different sexy types of exercises. And it's also the same thing in the kitchen because chefs are very embarrassed and, and you know insecure about doing two simple things. They want to show what they can do. Mm -hmm. and people at home often need really simple things. Totally. Your body needs right. simple things. So it takes a very secure you know fitness expert, mm -hmm. um, trainer, chef, doctor to be able to just say, I know it sounds too easy. I know you want something more elaborate, but hey, you can just do this. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean to interrupt, but we do have a great question. It's for yeah. both of you. So hi, George. Thank you for following us. Um, the question is, and we talked about um, fasting last week, so it's, it's a kind of carrying on with that theme and what you both touched upon mm -hmm. today. So it says, what are Chris and or Dr. Sam's thoughts on intermittent fasting? I'm referring more about going 12 to 16 hours and I am uh, interested in their opinion on postponing breakfast until noon because of the fast. So I think probably we should start with a little recap from last week and then for the fitness mm -hmm. or yeah. what, how oh. that was playing. Sure, yeah, that's a great question, George. Uh, so the intermittent fast, as you pointed out too, is another way of saying a time-restricted feeding. So you're eating maybe for eight hours a day and 16 hours off uh, and commonly done that we don't eat until about midday, until like eight o'clock. Um, so from health perspectives, you know, when you don't feed the cells, they often are happier. Uh, when you starve the gut, it often kills bacteria. It's shown to be helpful for the brain and metabolism and weight loss. So there are some benefits that I like. And since a lot of the cultures that Amy and I talk about had fasting in from a religious perspective, I think the intermittent fast is a easy thing to do. Now, there are some question marks, and I haven't discussed with Chris yet, but I was reading some recent material that, you know, we might say, oh, okay to have a black coffee or black tea. But even that isn't really traditionally fasting. I mean, you're still, your body is using those materials, those, those mm -hmm. nutrients. So should it be, you know, just water or is, is some black coffee or tea okay? But I know it can impact on the weight, I'm sorry, on the metabolism and on the muscle mass. And so I love your take on it, Chris, because a lot of patients are doing it, a lot of our clients, uh -huh. and how you're looking at intermittent fasting and where you see it with your yeah. people. So uh, I'll admit I do it. Um, more of a lifestyle because of my way I work um, but I have having studied a lot and been with a lot of professionals who've done it female and male let's start with female I know a lot of females almost all have had those that are highly active um, and are professionals it's been very detrimental to them hormonally mm. as a female with uh, menstrual cycle and those sort of things um, for those of you that will train in the morning and you intermittent fast till noon, you're going to be in the tank somewhere up till if you train at six and you intermittent fast and you'll do anything, you're going to be in the tank blood sugar wise in your, in your prime day of your work. If you were going to do that, then we would have you supplement with what we call branched chain amino acids so that it would stop the breakdown of the, the muscle. Um, and, and prolong it for you. Um, if you have a hard time with blood sugar issues, I would not recommend it. Train in the morning and fast. That would just because you're just not going to be performance wise. You're not blood sugar like low blood sugar or high blood sugar? Low, low. Right, so yeah. hypoglycemia or low blood sugar is very common in people who are fit, mm -hmm. and especially in women, as yeah. you said. So if a, per if a woman or anybody gets dizzy easily or has to eat, every three hours, mm -hmm. you'd be much more concerned about them doing intermittent fasting, it sounds like. Yes. Um, for those of you that have a hard time sleeping, um, there's a lot of hormonal cycles and um, peptides and hormones that happen in your cycle at night. So you would wake up craving carbohydrates, then you know amino acid supplementation and, and fasting and, res and resetting your, meta your, your hormones then it would be a very beneficial thing to me. So then what happens is you're not, you're not taking the neuropeptide Y and those type of things and craving carbohydrates in the morning and then setting your neurotransmitters up to overeat at lunch. So then it's a very positive thing that way. And then we need to work on the sleep and 
So, so, so you're somebody who's um, an expert, but also practices this way. So on days that you intermittently fast, uh -huh. or you're not working out those days? Itself? No, what a great what, question. What happens? I work out later, like 10, 11, and then I would have a protein shake to um, fill up my glycogen stores. Um, the protein would regulate me um, from dropping blood sugar wise. Yeah. Then I would eat. And then my cycle would be from then till eight or nine and get my feeding in that way. Gotcha. Right? So I plan the workout, then the feed. I don't work out and then let it go. Gotcha. Because if I let it go, then I, I, I will fall off the wagon right. big time. Yeah. yeah, so that'd be interesting for George to see, George, how, how you would how I'd do that. Um, I know myself, I try to... Uh, Eat like a monk on days that I don't work out. Mm -hmm. George has actually been to monasteries in Greece. Uh, so, so George speaks the language. Maybe yeah. we we'll talk about it in Greek, George. But so maybe eating like Mount Athos uh, and the monks at Mount Athos on days that you're not working out, and then eating more comprehensively, more calories on days that you are. Mm -hmm. This reminds me, Chris. You know this great question that George has is when I started looking at what fitness trainers and bodybuilders and those who were cut like a diamond, so to speak, mm -hmm. what they were eating, they were eating all the food groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would have complex carbs and they'd have beans and they'd have healthy fats and animal proteins and vegetable proteins. They weren't restricting, mm -hmm. they weren't dieting. Uh, and I love your take on that because I think most people think that you have to do a low carb or you have to you know, do low fat uh -huh. And those who are healthy, those who are fit, really are eating, you know, they're reading all of Amy's cookbooks and not just a certain sections about low carb. Right. Because, uh -huh. you know, a lot of times I'll give them Amy's cookbook and they're like, where's the low fat section or the low carb section? Right. And I said, these cultures didn't do that. Uh -huh. You know, they didn't kind of have this silos of reductionist thinking and saying, this is a carb, this is a fat or a protein. They said, this is a food that's going to give me nourishment, uh -huh. give me joy. Uh, it may be an animal they sacrificed to their higher gods. It may be something to give them energy. Mm -hmm. uh, so you touch upon, upon that aspect of the food and people who are fit and what they're eating. Yeah, the eating healthy is boring in some ways um, for those that don't have a culinary background. I wish I did. Um, but you're right. We eat all the food groups. We, you have to. Is the more we exercise, the more we have to eat. That's why I use the acronym "Eat More, Exercise More." Mm -hmm. um, like you do on the days you don't exercise, um, your calories should be lower. All right, you don't. So what we like to say is, you need to deserve your carbohydrates. You deserve them by working for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't. So in a in a grand scheme scheme of a week, we would give someone a macro plan and teach them how to do that if they wanted to, and they were analytically driven and that would be successful for them in their scale of one to ten um, and we would monitor them with high days and low days based on their exercises so those that have um, followed a low carb type of diet and they exercise an obscene amount of time i would send them to dr pappas and i would have their blood work done because they're if they if we have data from their blood work their blood work is going to get worse because they they're not they need the carbohydrates for energy sure. and your body's going to take it from somewhere else and what will happen is you'll see inflammation drastically go up in their in their blood fats and stuff over time not at the beginning but over time because change is good in nutrition changing it up is always good for the body because the body gets really in a I'm not, I'm not, in a point of stasis mm -hmm. so you have to shock it just like you do with exercise mm -hmm. so it has its good points but a lot of times when people have had success they keep that success forever and it's not successful anymore and then it becomes a detriment sure and that you'll see that in the blood work as well That's uh, a what i wanted to ask amy uh, because her take on we tell the guys to eat these foods and they don't know what to choose and how to pick some of these foods and some of these recipes and because i tell them i said you need proteins from plants and animals mm -hmm. you need some carbohydrates uh, depending on the timing of it it may be after your workout mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how do you, Amy, think about that and, and can you share your experiences with recipes for especially the stubborn men? Sure. Because you're very good about making I'm stubborn things. too, so I don't judge. Oh, you're, you're pretty good though compared to others. But you know, some pragmatic advice because you're always very good at, at sharing with us 
Thank you. Some low hanging fruit. Sure, sure. Uh, sure. For those of us that are not who aren't. Uh, so I'll answer it. I'll, I'll ask you the, the question that we just got in. But yeah, so for cooking, um, and it ties into everything, you know, um, you said people a lot of times um, when they come in, they want to do the total fitness and they, they don't just add one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, you know, with what we find or what we're doing is that people, you know, they make that commitment. They, they have their vision statement and their affirmation of what they're going to do. They go to the grocery store, the farmer's market, they buy only really healthy, healthy raw foods. They have no idea how to prepare. They go home and day two, they don't know what to eat other than a salad because they don't know. So I say the same thing, like, you know, look for the recipes first. Make one addition and start adding some fish. You mentioned the fish oil, so we can add fish. And I've just been sharing recipes in the feed. So you can also actually go, there's a great uh, salmon with almond arugula pesto. So the salmon, you know, you get the great omega-3s from the salmon, but then you get the, also the omega-3s from the from the almonds and from the pesto, you get the, the leafy greens and the, the olive oil with the anti-inflammatory wow. effects. So I'm giving some recipes. Um, seafood, shrimp is a great thing. Mussels are a great thing. Mm -hmm. I just shared a Greek island uh, rice stuffed calamari. Wow. Um, it's really, really nice. It's like these things have gourmet feel, but they're very quick and easy to prepare. Yeah. 10, 15 minutes. They're delicious and they're, they're restaurant quality dishes. So for people who like seafood, you know, um, Dr. Pappas and I also mention, always mention adding one additional serving of seafood per week to your diet, no matter what you're eating, can give you some great effects, reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, and it's it's a wonderful thing. Also, um, after, the, after the seafood, you can think about the leafy greens because as Chris mentioned, most people aren't getting the leafy greens in their diet. So we don't even think about them, but a real easy low hanging fruit, as you would call, is spinach. You know, spinach is everywhere. It's in restaurants, it's in fast casual places, it's in the supermarket. A um, lot of water, especially moisture content as we're going into the summer, but um, all of those great, you know, antioxidants mm -hmm. and things in the, in the spinach. Baby kale is very easy to get a hold of. Broccoli yeah. is so wonderful. Yeah. Um, you were talking last week at Rika about how broccoli can all, um, positively really affect changes in our, even our DNA. Right. So there's a lot of protein per calorie and broccoli has more protein than meat. So broccoli is a great one, easy for everybody to eat. Um, I like to mention that cucumbers also in the summer because they have a lot of uh, water in them, so they're very good for us. And then beans and legumes, um, good, healthy, complex carbs. People in America tend to forget about beans and legumes unless you're going to like, you know, a Latin restaurant or maybe an Indian restaurant. But um, one serving of beans a day, whether it's chickpeas or pinto beans, black beans, uh, cannellini beans, you know, uh, or lentils. Red lentils cook in three minutes and they can be added to anything. Well. Three, mm -hmm. They're just very cream. You just put them in the water and oh, they start to disintegrate uh -huh. and you can make them you know, into a puree for like a dip with crudite. Um, all of these things are great. So I'm sharing lots of recipes. Um, I also do a blog post, especially for Father's Day and Men's Health with like recapping what we're talking about, but also um, with some additional recipes for people. And then I want to just, you know, point out, if you go back to when we did the anti-inflammatory uh, class, that, that was, um, it's all on, on the Papa's Health website. You can see all of our old ones um, from one of our earlier episodes. Uh, there are recipes there, but they're also a spice mix. So as people are doing the fish and the seafood, I think, you know, you said, if you don't like it, you're not going to eat it. Well, people think about fish and greens. They're like, oh, you know, boiled greens or maybe some something braised in a little bit of water and just baked fish with no flavor. But getting, getting these great spice mixes, herbs, things like that give it a lot of flavor. So you're, you're eating healthy by accident, which is what I like to call it. Mm -hmm. accident. And then we have a great question. So I'm going to ask you guys this question uh, from Gail. How does someone who doesn't exercise that much start a fitness plan? So they come to you and you're determining yeah. they need a fitness plan and then you can mm -hmm. take it over. Right. So first we got to get Chris Moore on Facebook Live and, and on Twitter and YouTube so they can watch his uh, words of wisdom. Uh, but I would often tell him, listen, here's some low hanging fruit, as we said, but then work with with an expert and professional. Uh, so I might tell them, for example, take the stairs. I think the stairs are really underappreciated, Chris. Mm -hmm, yeah. I, I, I tomorrow knows I do them every day. Mm -hmm. and I think from I don't know all the physiology behind it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but my understanding is, you know, carrying your weight up, you know, as a cardio and a kind of resistance work. Mm -hmm. So I'll incorporate stair work. Uh, I'm also a fan of any ages, but especially as you mentioned, as you get older, one of my favorite uh, things to do is exercise bands. Mm -hmm. So I might tell them more stair work at the office, uh, exercise bands a couple of days a week, these mm -hmm. resistance bands that you can stand on and, 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 and kind of pull, and then go see Chris uh -huh. for some, for, for some uh, uh, a deeper dive. So, No, it's, it's, I, those are great. Uh, 
one of the things that people need to appreciate who haven't started an exercise program, people who do exercise and don't appreciate from others, the hardest thing for people to do is walk through the door. All right, it's the hardest thing to do. If you can get them through the door, it's a, it's a win. Yeah. But before they have that self-confidence and the self-worth and they lose the shame of that feeling of going, though people in the gym don't think those things, you know, exercise videos, walking, doing bands are great. Now, when you get to the gym, the gym is an intimidating place for someone who hasn't been there. So there's the big gyms are really segmented. We call them big boxes and they're segmented into areas. There's a cardio area. There's um, a weighted area, which is really scary for people. There's exercise rooms. Now there's yoga rooms, Pilates rooms, soul cycle rooms, tra group training, <laughs> so many rooms on boxing. Do what you want to do, what you think looks fun. Then you have to ask for help. Hmm. But do something where you don't have to think about doing it. Wow. So you continue to do it. And then if you have an exercise, you exercise once a week. Just then, once a week. Then the next week, you do two. Hmm. Because it's just, it's that scenario. Of you, it has to be simple and it has to be attainable. Yeah. So if I tell myself I'm going to work out five days this week, and at day three and the week's over, you fit, you, in your mind you failed, right? Yeah. But if I can do one, if I tell myself I can do one day and I attain that one day, what's the chances I'm going to exercise another time that day? Right? So there's this famous psychologist, and I, I think we've talked about this, BJ Fogg from Stanford, and he did this study about flossing your teeth. And who wants to floss their teeth? But if you committed to floss one tooth a night, would you floss your whole mouth? If you just could, if you just did one tooth and you, you felt good because you did that, what are the chances you'd floss your whole mouth every night? The, the studies show super high, right? Yeah. So what I tell people is your goal is just one time this week. They always get more than one time. That's great. We've got more questions coming yeah. in too. Thank you. Well, I, I think that was a great question by Gail. And just to, to finish that thought, I love the idea of just some exercise videos. You know, a friend, a friend of ours in the practice is uh, Denise Austin. And Denise mm -hmm. was one of the pioneers in the fitness movement. The pioneer. Yeah, the pioneer, right? Uh, I, I love the fact that Denise was the only person of Jack LaLanne's protege who actually, you know, acknowledged Jack LaLanne and, and her roots and how she got started. And to this day, you know, I tell patients, you know, pull out the, the Denise video. Uh -huh. My mother-in-law still uses Denise's videos to keep in shape. Uh, so I love that idea of using things at home. Uh, so even if Gail can't get to see Chris, she can do some things at home, use technology. Maybe it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Denise and her friends on, on, on Facebook or, you know, on uh, yeah. Instagram. Mm -hmm. Denise and her daughter are now working together and using Instagram and things of that nature. There are a lot of great fitness people on Instagram. Really yeah. Yeah. Simple, easy tips. The technology now in fitness is exploding. So for those of you that are watching, if you don't like the gym, they have literally bought the gym in-house now. So uh, Peloton has done a really good job and, and are at the forefront. So there's trainers now online when you're working out that are there. They are now taking that and now they're adding dumbbells and stuff. So you'll do the bike, you'll get off, you'll do dumbbell work with the trainer. Um, they've added a treadmill. Wow. Um, uh, Nordic Track has added that, Life Fitness has added that. So the virtual world now is out there hmm. and now the virtual training centers are, are on the move. Yeah. Um, I think they, they have some issues with cleanliness with that, but I think we'll get through that. But the technology now is yeah. there for people to, and, and if you have Comcast or Verizon, if you go on to the fitness, fitness TV, they have a multitude of things you can do online, on TV, in your home, that's free. That's great. Yeah. That is fantastic. So two new questions. First one is from another Gail. I believe she's a friend of yours, Gail Borroquez. She says, how much fish oil per day? Um, I would say, Gail, yeah, it's a great question. You know, Chris and I are, are bullish on fish oil. Um, I look at the amount of omega-3 rather than the fish oil, and, and we have some supplements we like to use. But so for example, um, one serving of this is like 1,300 milligrams of omega-3. The average fish oil pill, one pill, is like only 300 milligrams. I think most people need like a thousand milligrams of omega-3. Mm -hmm. So that could be one serving of a high potency or three servings of a lower potency, but probably a thousand milligrams of omega-3, that would be a good place to start. Unless you have high triglycerides uh, or a lot of inflammation, you may go higher. Some of the 
uh, people that Chris and I work with, because we're very much interested in biochemistry as well, Chris and I are, will push the omega-3s to super high levels to help with brain health uh, and joint health. But I think a thousand milligrams of the combination of EPA and DHA would be a place to start. That's great. And another question that we have is from, let's see, I just lost it here. I believe his name was Mohsen, and he's asking how to lose belly fat. Well, yeah, I, that's a great, great question, and I love Chris's take. When I think about the belly fat, especially in men, I think of our friend Jim Laval's, you know, metabolic triad of, triad of men's hormones and men's health, and he says three hormones in particular push on men and create metabolism problems. Uh, one is cortisol stress, mm -hmm. especially if we're not sleeping, if we're you know, on alert and worried. The hormone insulin, so if we're storing fat, if we're having a high carb meals, uh, if we got belly fat around there for, from the carbohydrates. And then testosterone, and we can discuss testosterone mm -hmm. as well. So those three hormones, so when somebody's trying to lose belly fat, I'm thinking, are those hormones maximized? Can I? have patients do things to improve the hormones and push the levers. Uh, so I'm thinking of sleep, fitness, nutrition, supplements, mm -hmm. when I'm trying to move the needle on men's belly fat. Mm -hmm. But I love your take on that because That's a lot of guys, you know, they, they'll they hear what you're saying, but like, Doc, Chris, I wanna know what to do to get the inch off or uh -huh. to the waist, because right. as I like to say, you know, the bigger the waist, the smaller the brain, uh -huh. uh, the lower the testosterone. Right. You know, the weaker the erections. For sure. We can discuss men's health and uh, and hormones, but you know, all these things impact mm -hmm. on, on that vital part yeah, as well. Yeah, the, the, what I like to tell men first, if you're not waking up with the TP in the morning, there's an issue, okay? Generally, the first thing you talk about is sleep, all right? So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, it is huge, massively huge. Um, the next thing is, is um, you're gonna to have to strength train hard, but what, what we need to understand when we're losing weight, your body's gonna lose it in a certain way. Nine times out of 10, your belly's the last thing to go, mm. right? That is reality, that is the truth. If you, look, if you research uh, male models doing for a photo shoot, everyone freaks out at the end because their abs aren't popping out yet because wow. it's the last thing to go. Because it's what, as males, it's where we store most of our body fat. So what happens is to do it right, and I, I mentioned this in the beginning, there has to be a slow delineation and calorie loss in your food plan over time, all right? And if you guys may have touched on this in other, in other shows, but weight loss is not a linear straight down. It is down, up, down, up, up, down, 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 up, down. It is a very gradual up and down scenario. And it has to be. Because if weight loss was goes straight down, everyone would be where they want to be. Right. So we have to manage the peak and the valley. We have to put weight on to take weight back off. Because you have to play with the metabolism a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it is a long-winded question, but sleep to me would be number one. Because if you're if you're feeling great, you're gonna exercise harder. You'll have more mental acuity to eat healthier, and you'll put better things in your mouth. That's a great point. Yeah. I would say another factor for a lot of our guys, Chris, is if they're serious about belly fat and losing weight, is to get rid of the alcohol. Nope, oh, huge. Especially yeah. in yeah. the beginning, uh, to reduce it minimally, if not get rid of it. And I always say it pains me as a Greek to think that alcohol isn't part of the food group, mm -hmm. but I think men don't understand the alcohol will affect their sleep and then will definitely impact on their ability to make enough testosterone mm -hmm. and they make too much estrogen. Yeah. So the hormone play, and this is why labs are so important. You know, Chris and I uh, both do this for our clients. You know, we want them to get data to personalize it and hormones. And uh, just recently I was telling Chris, I've had a number of men who've had a lot of estrogen and trying to brainstorm ways to improve that estrogen. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's often from belly fat causing estrogen, uh, the lack of sleep, the alcohol, the foods, maybe they're high in carbohydrates, uh, toxins and not detoxifying. 
so the environment so I, we've seen a lot of hormone problems in men and uh, so I, I think those things are relevant but I want to segue that into your take on the topic of testosterone uh -huh. uh, from the fitness perspective to how you work with patients on that because so many of our clients are suboptimal or uh -huh. low on testosterone right and, and I think it's been vilified Mm -hmm. uh, I, often will I often will tweet about the research behind testosterone, how important it is for men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd love your take on that because I know you've taken deep dives uh, in hormones and right. on testosterone. Yeah, the, one of the ways we deal with hormones in, the, in a fitness facility with clients and, and for men in general, uh, because studies have shown the more muscular you are, the healthier you are. And when I say more muscular, I'm not saying a big buff guy. I'm just saying more muscular to body fat, right? So you and I would have more muscle mass because we don't have a lot of fat mass, but a muscular guy in all in general, he will live longer than someone who is not. That's a great point. Okay, it's proven, scientifically proven. So both men and women, right? Yes, so correct. Both men yeah. and women, yeah. So to provide a well-rounded, um, program that deals with rep ranges. Okay, well, why is rep ranges important? Rep ranges when we train are important because different rep ranges necessitate certain hormonal responses in the body. So what's a rep range? So a rep range, for instance, would be uh, if I let's just say I'm doing a bench, a push up. Okay, anywhere from zero one rep to four reps is what we would call power, right? So it's a very excitable, what we call fast twitch muscle fiber. All mm -hmm. right. Anywhere from five to uh, eight is what we call uh, basically uh, maximal strength, okay? It is, I can get stronger, but I don't necessarily get bigger, all right? That may be pertinent to, let's say, a man who comes in, because this happens, and they say, I don't wanna get bigger. I just wanna stay what it is because I have 35 custom-built suits and I don't wanna have to change my shirt. And that is true. <laughs> Happens all the time. That's real world. Totally, right? So we can get them stronger without getting them bigger by controlling the rep ranges. Really, 10 to 12 is what we call hypertrophy strength or growing muscle. Anything above that is really endurance, mm. okay? Females are very different. They really grow in high endurance uh, rep ranges, okay? That's why a lot of CrossFit female athletes are really muscular interesting because it's so high rep ranges yeah. um so what we try to do is we try to navigate someone's uh genetic body type through testing where they will benefit the most in rep ranges so i benefit more uh between four and six and two to three and that when i go up higher i can only spend a couple weeks but then it's a detriment to mm -hmm. my body so i actually overtrain and my testosterone will drop, Interesting. okay? But then I can flow back and I can come back up, but it's actually, it helps me refresh my body. Someone may work better at higher ranges and their testosterone will pump up because we're working with the IGF-1 and growth hormone response when they sleep at night. Gotcha. So as much as we build the program, I'm looking at what it's gonna do for them at night and the recovery phase of what's happening. Of the sleep cycle too. So can you tell just by looking at them from like the build? Because one of the things we talked about recently was um, a book by a, a doctor, you know, the hunter farmer diet. Mm -hmm. And his hypothesis was, you know, if you have a, a a big build, like a wrestler's build, football player's build, you know, Chris, you're you're a big guy, that you have uh, even more challenges with carbohydrates potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but that if you have a thinner build like myself, perhaps, that you have more tolerance to carbohydrates. Right. So maybe the, the body habit is, and I know you do some fancy uh, testing with kind of genetics and fitness, but do you get a sense just by seeing a patient and their build you, of kind of- You uh, can definitely get a sense. What I've learned is that um, people are very different by, by, uh, by segments of their body. So we can actually test now hmm. just by, without doing muscle biopsies, whether you're fast twitch or slow twitch and where you fall just by simple testing. Um, but generally your somatotype can help drive um, your macronutrients that you should eat, but it also will help us tell what, what's better served for you 
strength training wise. So if you are generally someone who has bigger calves and bigger forearms, um, you're going to be someone who's going to put on muscle mass much easier. So I don't have to work as hard like a football guy, right? Mm. Someone who's narrow shouldered and long limbed, you're not, you're going to have a harder time lifting heavier weights because you, your, your mechanics of your body just aren't going to be able to go through it like a basketball player. So how do you work with those guys? It's a, we, a partial to basketball players. We, um, so we don't, this is my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, I don't, we do, if we do the main lifts for, for a high school athlete or even our professional guys, we don't do full range of motions with long limb guys because your joint mechanics are, are put in such imposing positions. So we use special, what we call lifts and blocks and stuff. So they, they, don't, they, they get the neuromuscular feed of the heavy weight. So they're, they're, the stimulus to the muscle can grow without putting them in a position where their joints are in an advantageous position. So what's an example of that? Um, so if you were gonna pick something up from the floor, like a, like a deadlift, yeah. we would lift it up 12 inches off the ground. Because uh, you know you're looking at tibia length, femur length, so that, that's a full, spine length. You exactly. would do like a clean yep. press. Or yep. Um, you would for guys that need to bench press because when they go to college or high school they have certain things they have to accomplish. I would never bench press to their chest until testing. We would lift it off their body so they can learn. They can accept heavy weight and get stronger that way, and it works. So how about for push up? A push up. You would do a full push up. I would. Guys? It would. I would change their elbow positions. Really? Because if you are going to, let's just say we take a child and you put a child on the ground, you say, get up. They don't put their hands in a push-up position. They put mm -hmm. them close and they push themselves off the ground. Okay, what, what, what society has done and trainers in my profession is they've taken elbows out and put you in bad positions that put the shoulder in a very detrimental position. Now you can change hand positions to get the rotator cuff to work, but truly the bent, the push-up really gets you off the ground and that's all it's really there for. There's nothing in life that you need to bench press for huh. unless you are a computer wow. in bench pressing. It's kind of functional. So thing. it's functional, right? Yeah. So yes, does it get your shoulders bigger and do those type of things? Yes. And is it fun? Yes. Do do guys think the girls love it? Yes. But do they know? I mean, I mean <laughs> we, we, yeah, we could go all day, yeah. right? Go but go there's a right. lot of things in life that you can look at and get people to do healthy and still get benefits from. As well. Because guys that have big chests generally have big chests genetically. Mm -hmm. um, sure, you can work towards it, but yeah. you have to really work towards it. So genetics plays such a huge part. I mean, the, the reds, some of the Redskins that I personally work with, and I've seen their parents. Um, one gentleman in particular, Lorenzo Alexander, I saw his dad, and I thought it was him. Wow. His dad never wow. worked out a day in his life. That's amazing. And he was amazing. You could tell, um, Amy, when I talked to Chris, it reminds me of what it was like in ancient Greek gymnasiums mm -hmm. where they would do fitness but also about life right and i right. think it's a great archetype of how to approach health especially for men is you know it's a mind body it's using high tech and high touch uh and it's not just you know getting into a silo and, and being a gym rat or going on crazy diets so one of the things that chris and i talk about a lot is is nutraceuticals that amy and i are big fans of mm -hmm. and, and using nutrients to help body composition help our goals. Uh, you touched upon that a little bit from the omega-3 in the fish oil to the branched chain amino acids. So I brought some of the ones that, you know, ones that Chris and I use, and there are a number of different brands, uh, but I wanted to kind of touch upon them briefly and get your take on them. Mm -hmm. So of course with the fish oil, you mentioned that, this happens to be a liquid version, which uh -huh. is often easier to take for higher doses. Uh, but Amy mentioned the fish, and I think fish is great for the brain uh, as well as the muscles yes. and, and the body and, and cardiovascular heart system. So I think that's that's fantastic. And then you mentioned, you know, amino acids and branch chain uh -huh. amino acids. And, and I'm very much a fan of those now, and I take them a lot as well. Uh, you mentioned doing them maybe on days that you're intermittently fasting. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so you would do that before or after the during. workout? So during, during the workout. During. The, the studies show that it's more optimal during the workout. So you put it in some water and just sip, and it. sip it during right. the workout. Yep. Great. Now, depending on the type, it could taste like battery acid, right. and you might have to mix it. Some yeah. of them are generally good now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's really kind of up to you. Right. But one of the things that in a lot of the lab work I've run on people, especially females, is they're very protein deficient, and that's where they're getting their amino acids generally from. So it is as much a 
it helps muscle recovery and the breakdown of muscle, but it also helps the functions of the kidneys and all those other things that need the branched chain amino acids to function and do the proper things to help filtrate the body of all the toxins and all the things you're doing to it on a daily basis. Wow. Great. Okay. So the amino acids, like a branched chain, this one happens to have some other aminos together with it, which I happen to like, and the taste is pretty decent. Um, and then, you know, we're bullish on multivitamins. Uh -huh. This is a good one that has an AM and a PM that has some other nutrients in there. But so many of our clients are just, you know, nutrient deficient on some of the building mm -hmm. blocks, the Bs, yep. well, the magnesium, D3, and then the D, it's exactly. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much is important for uh, muscle health and brain health. And I like this because this is a once a week, 50,000. Yep. So that's very nice. You can go up high on the doses. Chris and I are always going high on the doses. So to me, uh, a multi of fish oil, an amino acid, some D uh, are great building blocks. And then I will we'll think about, you know, what can also help the stress of the cortisol. So I brought some examples of some of these adaptogens. Mm -hmm. And these adaptogens are really what Amy and I, you know, think about from these traditional cultures, you know, there are plant extracts that help them feel better. Mm -hmm. Whether you put it in a soup or a dish or take an herb that gives you some energy. Um, you know, maca in South America, you know, to climb the mountains, the Indian uh -huh. mountains or, or rhodiola or ginseng. So I bought a few of these that, that I happen to like uh, for men in particular, but also for women. So maca is one of my favorites uh, as an adaptogen that helps with hormones and stress. Uh, another combination that has uh, rhodiola, uh -huh. which has been shown to help with cortisol. Uh -huh. And then uh, another one called HPA Adapt, which just helps with the brain chemistries and it has things like ashwagandha uh -huh. and some of these other herbs. So I often am asked by guys, what should I do? What should I take? Uh, and some people just need the once a week change uh -huh. you talk about. Yep. Others like us Jersey boys uh, or those thinking about Route 66 can uh -huh. do multiple things at once. Uh -huh. uh, so this is kind of some of the building blocks that I'm thinking about. But how do you kind of approach supplements? And you have a guy that, you like myself, who's like, Chris, I, I can do multiple things. I want to maximize uh, my effort, my, my progress. Uh -huh. That's a uh, great question. What, where, um, where do I kind of go? You know, uh, I've changed over the years for this and I've gotten hopefully way smarter. Um, and probably because of you. I, what I tell people is when you see commercials on TV, they're selling a supplement to you to sell it. They're not selling it to you. They're selling it because they want to sell money. But to me, it's like standing in front of a, of a map and taking a dart, closing your eyes and throwing it. You don't know. You don't know how much. You don't know how much to take. If it's enough, is it the right dose? How long do I take it? And that's where you've taught me that lab work is the king of understanding. You know, it's your roadmap, it's your complete GPS. And like when you go on a road trip, there's roadblocks, there's construction. And, the, and as we redo blood work, it will tell you when you're in a roadblock and you need to detour and change direction and, and change your supplements because we need them. Right. And lab work doesn't lie. You know, yeah. it's a videotape of Michael Jordan playing basketball or someone else playing a sport. It's a great analogy. It is your video of your sport yeah. and it's not lying and you got to listen to it. That's a great point. I mean, it's amazing how much of our young athletes aren't getting into blood work. Mm -hmm. And I tell them they should follow the Tom Brady approach to testing like these athletes and then reassessing. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, I know we're getting uh, close on time here, is uh, the role of body composition and you know we're going to send out some more information to to our our listeners and followers um, but in in honor of men's health we're going to have an we're going to have some open houses coming up we can do some body composition mm -hmm. for our, our friends and anyone who, who wants to you know free of charge to measure their muscle mass their body fat maybe discuss some of these principles maybe pick chris's brain along the way if we can as well uh, but Chris and I routinely use uh, body composition equipment to get a sense of what your needs are. So we're going to make that available, but I want to get your take on how you utilize that. You know, the first thing with body composition is it has to be done by the same machine or the same person each time. And regardless of what the number is, if it's going down, you're doing it right. 
So don't get hung up on the number. Or, or what I like to tell, and especially for females, don't become a slave to the number on the scale. Don't become a slave to the number of your body fat. or It's information, yeah. and let's take it and do something with it. And as long as it's going down, mm -hmm. that's positive. Because all the body all the body fat measuring and all that, all the BMI, it's, it's just data. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or you've done something wrong or heinous in your life. It's right. just a number. It's yeah. who you are. It doesn't make you. It's yeah. so, and that's that's really to me what becomes real important because I've seen so many people cry over a number, yeah, like and tremble and shake, yeah, and it's it it really upsets me. So I just have to go into the psychology of that stuff all the time, yeah, because because it's just data for us. And you know what? If you don't want to know it, don't know it. I'll know it. Yeah. Well, you'll know it and sure. as long as it's going down you're doing the right thing. right that's really cool. if it's going up let's talk yeah. more yeah you know? yeah exactly that's like that's a great way to uh to and i don't know if you have anything else to add amy um but it's been a great discussion and uh, i think so too no i really appreciate you guys having me this was great and i, I love appreciate this. everybody joining us thank you so much if you have in the future any ideas or any topics that you would like us to cover in the future just let us know and we can kind of integrate them and with what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned ancient culture, so I thought it would be nice if we gave a special little shout out to the Italians and the Greeks. Wow. Mm. So we, I noticed we have some uh, great people in Italy mm. following us. Um, carissimo saluto a tutti and sono molto contenta che ci riesci a seguire. Massimo Lucidi, um, who's the uh, head of the Premio Eccellenza Italiana, which is, uh, he's a famous journalist, but also uh, this organization gives awards to um, American organizations that are doing promoting uh, Italy abroad uh -huh. and, and international abroad. So he's watching us right, and right. we also have um, Antonio Leonardo Montuoro, who is in charge of the International Academy of the Mediterranean Diet in Italy. Wow. And they're doing fabulous work and uh, in Calabria, where my family's from. Uh -huh. So it's an honor to have them following oh, us wonderful. as well. Wow. It's yeah. amazing technology. You can get some yeah, of now. overseas. Yes. And for our Greeks, if you want any. Yeah, Unia Pola for those who may have name days and. Uh, um, Antonis, that's right, and Antonella, and Antonio. That's right, that's yeah, right, big exactly. Big name day today. Buono a tutti. Exactly. We're going, our family, for the first time in a couple of years, back to the homeland. So, of course, Amy has connections and knows about Greek uh, geography as well. So, for all of, you, all of those who are traveling this summer, a lot of our tribes go back to the homeland. Safe travels. Uh, we're uh, a call away, an email away, a Facebook uh, post away if you have any questions or comments. See you soon, and happy Father's Day, everyone. Yeah.